we are going to get started with a welcome and overview of ProTransport One from the supervisor of the Santa Clara County Station, Tim Taylor. Take it away, Tim. Hi, everyone. My name is Tim. Uh, like Didi said, I, I run the Santa Clara Station here. Um, I'm just going to go over a little bit about what we do here as a company, uh, a little bit about Santa Clara specifically, some of the great things that we get to do, uh, and then we'll go through all the rest of it. Um, so real quick origin story um, on myself, just to kind of familiarize yourself with me. Uh, I started out as an EMT. Um, I did a lot of things before then. Um, I used to work in construction. Um, I've worked at retail. I've done pretty much anything you can think of uh, before, you know, wanting to make a difference in my community and uh, thinking about EMS as a career. Um, I started out here as an EMT, um, became a supervisor, and then um, actually recently uh, became the manager for the uh, entire area. So uh, a lot of fun for me, a uh, little bit more work, but a lot more fun. So um, that's just a little bit about me. Uh, there's plenty of time to ask questions later, but uh, about pro transport specifically. So pro transport started as a really small company. Um, these two founders of pro transport one ambulance company, Elena and Mike uh, started it out of a home office, a single. Uh, unit van. No. What's that? Um, single use van uh, out of a garage. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they saw a need. So um, pro transport one ambulance specializing is what's called IFT, which is interfacility transports. Um, these guys were working in the 911 system. Um, you know, you think uh, you call 911 for an emergency, an ambulance is going to come and pick you up. Um, sometimes you need to go to a different hospital uh, for whatever reason. Maybe the, the hospital you're at doesn't have the specialty required to treat you for whatever it is that you need. And you need to go to another hospital. Um, Back then, they would also call 911 and have an ambulance come and take that patient. Uh, that really delays patient care across the board. Um, you know, if you've got a 911 ambulance driving somebody from one hospital to another, uh, they can't respond to an emergency. Um, so these guys recognize that in this area. Um, started out a company to do just that, to transport from hospital to hospital to help out, to keep the 911 system running uh, nice and smooth. Um, from that one used ambulance and garage, we've grown pretty big. Uh, we encompass 23 different counties. We've got over 700 employees, over 120 different ambulances, uh, and 12 different operation centers. Um, we're also part of a, a bigger umbrella company called Covalent Health, uh, which has us uh, here in Northern California. PRN Ambulance in Southern California, Century Ambulance in Florida, ATS in Illinois, and Priority One in Indiana. So that one small mom and pop shop really, really grew. Um, the services that we do provide, uh, we've got BLS, which is basic life support. That's EMTs. Uh, what an EMT is, is an emergency medical technician. Um, it's first responder, first aid, um, some basic life support things like CPR, um, bleeding control, um, uh, splinting long bone fractures, uh, any neck injuries and uh, spine board injuries from car crashes. Those are all basic life support things. Uh, and that's what EMTs do. So we offer that service. We also offer ALS, which is advanced life support. Um, advanced life support is paramedics. Um, they can do a little bit more than EMTs. It takes a little bit more education, but uh, they can start IVs. Uh, they can give more medications than EMTs can. Uh, they also carry a monitor instead of an AED and the monitor allows them advanced cardiac opportunities um, for uh, shocking it should the, shark, the heart need to be shocked. Um, more than just an AED self-read, they can play with the voltage, but that's a, you can learn all that in medic school when you go. Um, we offer CCT, which is critical care transfer. Um, that's nurses. We're going to hear from a couple of nurses here in just a little bit. Um, but those are, you know, 
the highest level of medical intervention needed during transport, these are the ones that are running that call. Um, you know, they're, they're super awesome. We also offer wheelchair and gurney transports. Um, and we also cover special events. And uh, here in Santa Clara County, we're real lucky on that. I, I saved a couple slides for just that. So we'll get there later. Overview of Santa Clara County in general. Um, obviously to work here in Santa Clara County you need to be accredited by the local EMS agency. Um, we've got hospital uh, contracts with five different hospitals in this area, uh, meaning we serve them. Um, 29 county permitted ambulances. Uh, we back up the 911 system here, uh, support them when they need help. And we're also contracted uh, for standby service for the SAP center and San Francisco 49ers. The Santa Clara County EMS Agency, uh, they're the regulatory agency that sets the policies and protocols we follow as EMS providers within the Santa Clara County. So we get to go through our EMT programs and paramedic programs, and they teach us all the things that we can do. Santa Clara County sets the guidelines of, of those things that we can do. So just as a for instance, I know we're going to talk about CPR here in a little bit, but um, the American Heart Association, the AHA, their guideline, and you need that card to work as an EMT anywhere in the country, but um, their guideline for compressions on CPR is 100 to 120 compressions per minute. Santa Clara County has done some other due diligence on their end, and they've decided that 110 compressions per minute is ideal. So we follow what Santa Clara County says, even though the American Heart Association says something else, we follow the Santa Clara County guidelines. So that's what the Santa Clara County EMS agency is about. They, they set all the rules that we follow. Um, on top of that, our primary roles in the county is um, IFT, like I said, the interfacility transports, taking patients from a hospital to another hospital if they don't have a specialty there, uh, taking patients from a hospital to a skilled nursing facility. If somebody breaks their leg, they go to a hospital. Um, the hospital can do surgery on it. And then once they're not, you know, sick enough to stay in the hospital, uh, you know, we don't want to keep that bed from somebody who needs it. So we can send them to a skilled nursing facility uh, and they can't drive there. Obviously they've got a broken leg. So uh, that's what we're there for. Um, we also do, uh, so on IFT, we do BLS, ALS, CCT, and NICU, PICU. Um, I've got some extra slides about NICU PICU, but what that is, is neonatal and pediatric intensive care units. Um, but yeah, so we specialize in IFT. Um, we assist the 911 system here in Santa Clara County. If um, there's super high call volume on the 911 system and they don't have enough ambulances to handle it, they call us and ask us to help them out. And so we do. That's one of the perks of being Santa Clara County accredited. We get to help them out. Um, we also help them during uh, MCIs, um, which is a mass casualty incident. So, you know, big, big car accident happens. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys are old enough to remember there was an incident at the San Jose airport where a plane had to crash land and uh, we helped out with that. Um, uh, we also assist our um, uh, our uh, facilities that we have contracts with for internal disasters, such as bomb threats and power outages, uh, they call us instead of bogging down the 911 system for assistance. Uh, I included this slide of our neighboring counties, San Mateo and uh, San Benito. Uh, we have mutual agreements with both of these counties to be able to operate in their county um, as EMS providers um, while following Santa Clara County protocols. So. Um, in San Benito, we're able to do that on all levels of service. We also support their 911 system. Um, if anybody here knows anybody from San Benito County, like Hollister, it's a small, big county, but small towns. Uh, they only have a couple ambulances. So sometimes they need a little bit of help with their 911 system and we can do that. Um, San Mateo County, we, we help them out with BLS, uh, which is two EMTs or CCT, which is nurses. Um, and that's all we do in that county. Sorry about that. Uh, as I said previously, we've got five contracted facilities here. Um, regional hospital, I'm sorry, 
uh, St. Louis Regional Hospital, O'Connor Hospital, Good Samaritan, Stanford, and Lucille Packard. And uh, when I say we're contracted with these facilities, um, it just means that they call us first. Um, if they have somebody that needs to be transported, you know, we're responsible for that. So they'll let us know that they have a patient going from here to there. Um, Stanford and Lucille Packard is a little bit more intricate, but uh, the other three, we just, they give us a call and we transport their patient. A little bit more about these hospitals specifically. Uh, Stanford, I'm sure many of you have heard of Stanford. It's a very prestigious hospital. Uh, patients come here from all over the country uh, for treatment. It's one of the largest and most expansive specialty hospitals on the West Coast. And because of that, we transport patients to and from all over the state of California, as well as Nevada and Oregon. Um, so, I mean, we've taken, I personally have taken a patient all the way to Oregon. Um, it was a fun, fun drive. Uh, did that on one shift, so that was cool. Um, I know we go to Reno pretty often. Uh, we go out to the Valley, uh, Fresno, Visalia, Bakersfield pretty often, uh, just for Stanford. Um, among all the specialties that Stanford does is trauma. They're one of three trauma centers in Santa Clara County. Uh, so because of that, we do transport a good amount of trauma um, incidents to Stanford. Um, if a patient gets brought to another hospital, um, they need to go to Stanford because it's a trauma center. Uh, the treatment is a little more specialized there for that. And just in case you guys didn't know, traumas are things like, uh, you know, a, a motor vehicle accident or a, a fall from uh, a height. Um, one of the cool things that Stanford does is their life flight program. Uh, they've got a helicopter, it's branded for Stanford and their life flight. Uh, as you can see here, their service extends all the way up to Reno, all the way down to Santa Barbara, all through the Central Coast and the Valley. Um, sometimes they're unable to fly, whether it's due to weather uh, or the location of the incident. Um, or they're not being a helipad at one of the other hospitals that they need to go pick up from. Um, we have our Stanford uh, Life Flight branded ambulance and we'll transport their Life Flight team uh, with us. And that entails uh, two RNs, two registered nurses. Uh, on occasion, they'll bring someone on uh, like a perfusionist or a respiratory therapist, which are people who specialize in those other fields. Um, but, uh, the same sort of goes for Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. It's one of the best known children's hospitals on the West Coast. It's actually attached to Stanford. So again, just a really prestigious uh, medical center. Um, because of Lucille Packard, we transport patients from all over the state to and from Lucille Packard, as well as tra transport patients flying in and out from out of state with Lucille Packard dedicated CCT transport team. So again, that critical care transport team, these are the highest acuity patients uh, so they need the highest level of care. So we're bringing on some nurses and some respiratory therapists. Um, at Lucille Packard, we have dedicated ambulances and those are staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, just to help with their uh, patient load. You know, it's neonatal and pediatric intensive care. So those are, uh, you know, really sick kids and sick babies that we really want to help. Good Samaritan also has a NICU rig. It's not as uh, not as big of a, a NICU department as Lucille Packard, so it's it's not used quite as often. Um, but they also have their own helipad ER department, and they specialize in some other things like cardiac uh, issues and strokes. Um, O'Connor's along the same lines of Good Sam, where they have a stroke and um, cardiac center. And then St. Louis is the southernmost hospital in the county. We have the contract with them. Uh, so it's kind of nice. We've got Stanford at the north and, and St. Louis at the south. So we cover all of Santa Clara County. And uh, we get a lot of uh, really great patients out of here. Um, and like I said, uh, as if all that stuff wasn't fun enough um, to keep us busy and, and enjoying our job, we also get special events through SAP and Levi's. Um, we have the San Jose Sharks, their minor league team, the Barracuda, uh, Bellator MMA, when it comes to SAP Center, they give us a call and we were there for the players and the, uh, and the talent, the fighters. Um, WWE, when it comes to town, calls us and we also have the San Francisco 49ers. Um, 
I wanted to include this. Uh, this, I mean, obviously, I, I really enjoy this part of the job. Um, I, I'm fortunate I enjoy every part of this job, but uh, it's really cool to get these types of things uh, to work. Um, I, I think most people who think of EMTs don't think of things like really cool special events like the 49ers or the Sharks or MMA, but you know, those are really physical sports where if somebody gets hurt, they need to get to a hospital and they don't want to wait around to call 911 for an ambulance to show up. So they actually have an ambulance sitting on standby. And that's just one of our other specialties that we do. And we're super fortunate to get that. Um, we've gotten to work a lot of really, really cool events because of it. Um, I don't know if that one came through. But, uh, you know, uh, got some really great photo opportunities here. Uh, here you can see one of our medics at one of the Sharks playoff games. Um, you know, uh, really great seats that we didn't have to pay for since they're paying us to be there. Uh, same with the uh, 49ers game here, you know, right behind the bench. Really, really awesome. And then uh, with covering those uh, 49er games, we also got uh, the phone call a couple years back when uh, the Super Bowl was played at Levi's. And this is the uh, after the Super Bowl, they have the big stand that uh, the whole team was on. And uh, we got an opportunity to uh, to work that, which was just incredible. And, uh, you know, here's a nice group shot of uh, some of the employees here that got the opportunity to work at the Super Bowl that, you know, again, you think of an ambulance, you maybe don't think of being at the Super Bowl to watch the game, but it was something that we got to do. Um, yeah. Uh, that's it for me for now. Um, I'll be back to answer plenty of questions. Um, right now, I'm going to turn it over to my friend Zach. Um, and uh, we got a nice little ride along to go on with him. What's up, guys? My name is Zach. I'm Sunny. Philip. And I'm V. We're the critical care transport crew here at Pro Transport today, and you're riding with us. What's up, guys? My name is Zach, and I'm one of the critical care transport nurses here at Pro Transport. And today, you guys are going to be riding with us. So we're going to introduce you to some of the critical care nurses that we have and the critical care EMTs. And we're going to show you about the gear, what we do, how to drive the ambulance, and it's going to be a great day. Come on. All right, guys, so we're going to come in. We're going to start the day with our gear. And let's meet V. V is one of our critical care transport nurses. Hi, guys. V, how long have you been a nurse? I've been a nurse for four years. Awesome. How long have you been working here at Pro? I have been working here at Pro for about three months now. Awesome. But before that, I was doing CCT with a different ambulance company. Gotcha. What did you have to do to do CCT here? Well, before I was a CCT nurse, I was an ER nurse for about a year and a half. Awesome. All right. So what do you do during critical care transport? Like, what is our job? Well, our job is to transport the very critically ill patients between hospitals. Um, so most of the time, there are patients who can't breathe on their own or they're too unstable and they need constant medications. Awesome. So doing your medications, what do you have here? Well, this is my medication box. So I have all the drugs that I might need to save someone's life. So during the morning, I check this to make sure that we have everything and it's not expired. So this is all epinephrine. So if someone has an allergic reaction to something, uh, this is the most common thing that you'll see them. They stab right into their leg so that they could start breathing again. Awesome. So what's the best part about working critical care transport? You know, the best part about working critical care is meeting the amazing patients that we have and also the wonderful team I get to work with. So Sonny here, he's one of our other CCT EMTs. Right now we're doing a gear check, which is what we do every morning. So Sonny, what are you checking right now? Uh, first off, we got the monitor right here. And this baby right here, we take out to every single call we go on. And then basically we hook it up to the patient. You know, we check their vital signs like their pulse, oxygen saturation, their blood pressure. And if need be, if the patient is pulseless and apneic, we can give them a shock and you know, that can uh, bring them back to life. 
right here, we have a ventilator. And for certain patients that um, basically can't breathe on their own, this device right here will breathe for them. And then what I do on scene is I take this tubing and I, uh, I connect it. And then I also assist my nurse by like putting in settings and then my nurse will double check my settings and then we'll go on from there. Awesome. that works here is Juliana. She's one of our lead critical care transport nurses here at Pro. So how are you doing, Juliana? I'm wonderful. How long have you been here at Pro? I've been here for just about two years. Awesome. How long have you been a nurse? Just about five. All right. Where did you work before here? Before here, I worked, uh, I started off as a new grad in the ER at uh, Mercy Merced Hospital. Then I came up to Sacramento and I worked in the ER and trauma step down units. And I loved that. And while I was doing that, I kept meeting CCT nurses, critical care transport nurses, and I thought that was an amazing um, path to go through. And so I started getting into that and I loved it. Awesome. My favorite part of critical care transport is taking care of the patients and getting them to where they need to be. We already showed you guys a lot about what we do, but what's most important is like teamwork and team dynamics. So what, what is that? How do we use that here at Pro Transport in the CCT division? We are merely a middleman for getting the patient to the highest level of care. And I love the dynamics that you um, create in this type of field. You have great crews that you work with and you're all unified in your vision of um, transport. Well guys, hope you enjoyed your time and your day with us here at Pro Transport One. Critical Care Transport is an amazing thing and hopefully one day you'll be riding the box with us. We'll catch you later. That was an awesome uh, tour, Zach. Thank you. I know you had to go on a call, so I'm, Zach will be joining us again later. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Catherine Fish. I am the Critical Care Transport Nurse Manager here at Pro Transport One. I, like all the other uh, highlighted guests here, started my career many years ago in EMS as an EMT, uh, over 30 years ago, and I've been a CPR instructor for 30 years as well. I teach all disciplines of that CPR. And like the beginning of career starting in EMS, uh, that beginning really gave me the passion and desire to go to nursing school 
And so later in life I did, and I earned my bachelor's degree in nursing and I've been with Crow Transport for about almost two years. And I love my job and I love the people I work with. But today we're gonna to talk about some exciting things. I wanna to talk to you today about some life saving interventions that we can do. I wanna to talk to you about signs and symptoms of a heart attack. <clears throat> Another word for heart attack is myocardial infarction. Myo means muscle, cardio is heart, infarction is death too. So death to the heart muscle is actually what's happening when somebody is having a heart attack. 80% of cardiac arrest or sudden death occurs outside of the home around our family and friends and those that we know and love. That's why it's so important for everybody to know CPR. So today we're going to just go over quickly a few symptoms. I want to uh, share a few videos with you and then at the end of the presentation, you'll be able to ask, ask any questions that you may have that come up during the presentation. So if we can go to the next slide, please. And this literally is a, is a very important statement that, that is on this slide. Everybody should know CPR. Again, every minute that goes by that somebody's heart is not beating and they are not breathing, their chances of survival for every minute decrease by 10% per minute. The average response time for 911 is between five and nine minutes, depending on where you are. If you get into the rural areas, it's even longer. So you are literally the person that can link to make a difference in someone's lives. When early CPR is started, what does CPR mean? Cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Cardio meaning heart, pulmonary being lungs, and resuscitate means to to do the job for them, resuscitate. We're doing the job, we're pushing blood that has oxygen to the important vital organs to help keep this person from getting brain damage and organ damage during a cardiac event. So every minute that goes by, these people have, like I said, 10%, five minutes is 50%. So that means that their chances of survival are 50% at five minutes, but our brain can only live a few minutes without oxygen and it starts to have damage that could become permanent. So that's why it's so important for us to begin these life-saving techniques. Studies through the American Heart Association have found time and time again, especially with hands only CPR, you have up to nine minutes to make a difference and uh, to be able to do CPR without any kind of breathing, just that alone can almost triple the chances of somebody surviving from a sudden cardiac death. So my question to you today is, you have the power to save a life. Are you ready? Are you okay? Are you okay? You, call 911. You, get an AD. This is a scene that plays out over a thousand times every day in the United States. If you see or find an adult or teen who has collapsed, they could be in cardiac arrest and you need to act now. Assess for any signs of movement or normal breathing. If the person has slow, deep gasps, this is not the same as breathing. Call 911 or direct someone to call. Treat. Press hard and fast on the center of the chest. Place the heel of your dominant hand directly on the center of the chest and interlock the fingers of your other hand. Keep your arms straight and lean over the victim using your body to compress the chest. Push down hard. You need to compress the chest at least two inches and push two times every second or 120 times per minute. Allow the chest to recoil completely with each compression. If the victim is on a soft surface, like a bed or a couch, move them to the ground before beginning compressions. You may have heard in the past that you must do mouth-to-mouth -mouth ventilations. Mouth-to-mouth -mouth is not needed for adults or teens and could be harmful. Perform chest compressions only. However, mouth-to-mouth -mouth is needed for young children and infants. While performing chest compressions, direct someone close by to get an AED. 
The AED, or Automated External Defibrillator, is the only thing that will shock the victim's heart back into normal function. When the AED arrives to the victim, simply turn it on and follow the voice-guided instructions. Unit OK. Stay calm. Check responsiveness. Call for help. Attach defib pads to patient's bare chest. Don't touch patient. Analyzing. Don't touch patient. Analyzing. Shock advised. Don't touch patient. Press flashing shock button. Shock delivered. Start CPR. The AED will only deliver a shock to someone who needs it, so do not be afraid to put it on anyone who is unconscious. Now that you know how to act, let's watch this again. Are you okay? Are you okay? You, call 911. You, get an AD. Keep your arms straight and lean over the victim using your body to compress the chest. Push down hard. You need to compress the chest at least two inches and push two times every second or 120 times per minute. Unit okay. Stay calm. Check responsiveness. Call for help. Attach defib pads to patient's bare chest. Don't touch patient. Analyzing. Shock advised. Press flashing shock button. Shock delivered. Start CPR. In many instances, an ambulance or other medical professional can be five to ten minutes away or more. Continue chest compressions while rotating compressors every two minutes until help arrives, and continue to follow the instructions of the AED or 911 dispatcher. You be the hero. Teach your friends and family to act now. So I want to talk to you today also about signs and symptoms of a heart attack. So the first thing, one of the most common symptoms is uh, people will describe it as chest pain, being anywhere from an uncomfortable pressure in the center of the chest or heaviness. Some may say it feels like an elephant sitting on my chest. I can't catch my breath. It feels like indigestion. It's got to be something I ate. Nausea, vomiting possibly can happen. And also the pain in their chest will come and go or it can stay. But the other big warning sign is when it radiates into the jaw, can go down into the arms, can experience uh, pain in the shoulders. Women typically, especially women who are older past childbearing age and have atypical symptoms, which means symptoms that we may not normally relate to that, like shoulder pain, back pain uh, in the upper back. So I'm gonna show you a video of actual people who have a few, um, to describe what they went through when they had the signs and symptoms of a heart attack when they were experiencing it. So you can see from actual patients who had uh, experienced this. So if we can play that video, hopefully it'll go through. I had pains in my chest and I couldn't breathe. It was just like someone had set me on fire. Started with the pains in my shoulders. I was feeling this pain in the center of my chest that wasn't normal. And Richard said, are you okay? And I half answered with, I don't think so. But the worst was when it went into my arms and down to my wrist. I woke up in the ER that evening. Warning signs can be different for everyone, but there are several distinct warning signs or symptoms of a heart attack. Uncomfortable pressure, squeezing, fullness or pain in the center of the chest that lasts more than a few minutes or goes away and comes back. Symptoms can include pain or discomfort in one or both arms, the back, neck, jaw, or stomach. Some victims complain about leg cramps and pains. Shortness of breath, which may occur with or without chest discomfort. 
Other signs may include cold sweats, nausea, or lightheadedness. If you experience any of these signs, chest discomfort, pain in your upper body, arms and legs, shortness of breath, nausea or dizziness, take immediate action. Don't wait. Call 911 and get to a hospital right away. By acting quickly, you can benefit from new drugs and treatments that can minimize your heart damage, increase your odds of a speedy recovery, and even save your life. But time is critical. So basically, I wanted just you to, to hear from a few people with that, uh, symptoms that they incur when they have sudden cardiac uh, problems. Remember that everything in your body works together, starting at the cellular level, and even your heart, it has to have a blood supply. So basically, when, when that blood supply gets blocked, it affects every other cell in your body because you can't get oxygen to the heart, the heart is unable to do its job to get oxygen to all the other important vital organs in your body throughout your bloodstream. So everything works together, just starting from the very beginning in a cellular level, that's really important to know. So um, before uh, I answer any questions, we're gonna go ahead and listen to a few interviews from some uh, of our other uh, wonderful star performers here at Pro Transport. We're gonna hear from Madison, who's an EMT, and we're also gonna be hearing from Tim, who's a paramedic. Hi, my name is Madison, and I'm an emergency medical technician, and I do interfacility transport, which means I transfer patients from one hospital to another hospital, from a hospital to a nursing facility, and a wide variety of things like that. So a little background on myself, uh, when I was in high school, the Palo Alto Fire Department had a fire explorers program for high school students to learn and get early exposure with emergency medicine and firefighting. When I joined that program, I knew immediately that that was what I wanted to do was emergency medicine. I was so taken by it. I graduated a year early from high school and I uh, went to EMT school at Foothill College and uh, then took the national registry exam once I turned 18 and, uh, and then started working. So I have a few questions they wanted me to answer. So the first one being, what inspired or motivated you to pursue this career? When I was 11, my family uh, adopted a little seven-year-old boy from Haiti, and uh, he had a really big um, habit of shoveling his food. And on this particular day, my mom had to leave um, a little earlier before the babysitter got to the house. And so I, being the oldest, was in charge of my younger brother and my younger sister. And uh, within that short amount of time, I had made my brother a sandwich and some grapes. And, uh, and like I said, he had that particular day, he started shoveling a bunch of grapes in his mouth and uh, that resulted in him choking and he had a full airway obstruction. So I had performed something called the Heimlich Maneuver, uh, which is a skill that I had learned two weeks prior before the incident had occurred and the first maneuver didn't work and then the second one everything came out and i had called 911 and the paramedics and the emts arrived to make sure he was okay and that's when i knew that i was like that is exactly what i wanted to do um, was emergency medicine and then i joined the fire explorers and you know the rest is history uh, so the second question is what qualities or personality traits do you think are the most important or helpful in your role? So I personally believe that people skills is one of the most important aspects of this career. Um, you have to remember that these patients are in the hospital sometimes uh, for months on end. And uh, to have someone come and uh, transport them, who is kind and is there to listen to them, really makes a difference in their uh, uh, in their care. 
So um, I like to think of it as how would you want your grandma or your grandpa or your mom or your dad or maybe even your best friend be treated in a hospital setting. And uh, if you look at it that way, it's uh, gonna make your uh, uh, experience a lot better. It's gonna make your patient's experience a lot better uh, looking at them as people and not as a number. Um, so I hope that this was helpful uh, and I hope to see some of you guys out in the field and uh, thank you. Hi everybody, I'm Tim. I'm a paramedic here at ProTransport. Uh, I've been a medic here for about seven years. I got started about 10 years ago as an EMT and then upgraded a medic a few years after that. Um, one piece of advice I would give to high school students that are looking uh, for a career in EMS or public safety is to do your best to keep your record clean um, because a lot of times in public safety, police, fire, EMS, the background checks are pretty extensive. So um, the less you have to explain later on, the better. So um, do your best to just, just keep your record clean um, so that you don't have to worry about that later on. Um, do I plan on pursuing additional training in another field or in this field? I do actually. Um, I originally got started here um, because I wanna be a firefighter. Uh, my plans have since changed uh, for now, and I'm pursuing a career in nursing. Uh, so while I was working here, I was able to um, start taking prerequisites for nursing school, and I'm awaiting uh, acceptance in there right now. Um, but this job was really good for on-the-job training and on-the-job learning. You're going to see and experience a lot of things in EMS um, that you wouldn't otherwise in another job um, that will prepare you for other careers in, in the medical field. So good luck to you guys, and thanks for listening. Bye. All right. Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, I, I just wanted to start out by saying, you know, thank you to everyone so far for spending time with us, getting to know us. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity, uh, myself, Madison, and Catherine. Unfortunately, we had uh, a couple other people here that were going to join us, but, you know, the nature of, of EMS is, you know, calls come up. Uh, but, uh, you know, luckily we all have time in the field. So any questions that you might have, feel free to ask. Um, you can type them in the chat if you have a question. Um, I have a couple of questions here that were given to us previously by your instructors. Um, but like I said, if, if there's anything that, that came up during that that you might have a question about, don't be afraid to uh, submit it in the chat. There's also going to be um, our emails provided afterwards if you wanna reach out privately. Um, so, uh, to start out, um, like I said, I've got Madison here and, uh, and Catherine, um, and I had a couple of questions that I wanted to ask very specifically, um, to them. Um, let's see here. Uh, so for Madison, uh, now that you're unmuted and, uh, your video has stopped playing, um, <laughs> What, is a, what does a typical day on the job look like for you? Yeah, sorry about the confusion earlier. Um, so a typical day, I will come in, I clock in, um, I will grab my radio and uh, the tablet that we use for um, writing EPCRs on, and I make sure everything works, and then I head out for my day. Um, we usually do our standbys uh, at the hospital. Um, and we transport patients um, from typically from one hospital to a, a nursing facility, a skilled nursing facility, or um, from a skilled nursing facility back to their uh, residence. Um, and we, we write up something called an EPCR, which is a, uh, a documentation uh, that we write up of everything that we um, did. So whatever care, whatever you did with that patient, you write it down. Um, and that is for um, uh, kept as records. So in case something goes wrong, you can look back and uh, you have everything there um, written up. It's basically a story about what you've, um, uh, uh, let's see how to say it. Um, um, a story of, of what you did on that call. So that is my typical day. If you have any questions from there, I can answer that. 
And uh, I mean, that was great. Uh, I want Catherine to also answer the same question just to get that CCT experience in there. Um, but before we do, I know this is one of the questions that's addressed later, um, but I think it's just a very important question and especially in, uh, in EMS, in any of the fields of EMS, but uh, someone just asked, does it ever get stressful? Um, and I know at, at least for personal experience and I'd like for um, my other two colleagues to answer, but uh, absolutely it gets stressful. Um, and I know one of the other questions was a follow-up question as to, you know, how do you handle that? Um, and it's, you know, I, I think everybody has a hobby, whether it's just listening to music, some people go rock climbing, some people run, uh, those people are crazy to me, but uh, some people do it. Um, and it's finding that hobby that, you know, that you enjoy and, uh, you know, being able to enjoy that hobby to kind of help relieve your stress. You know, I don't know if you can tell by the frame, I'm a pretty big guy. I lift a lot of weights. Um, uh, that's how I deal with it. I also play the guitar and uh, I have, uh, uh, my daughter's going to be two here in just a little bit. And uh, um, she's super awesome at, at helping me deal with stress uh, if she's not creating more being two. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, it definitely can get stressful dealing with, um, you know, either patients that are upset, patients that are really hurt, um, or, you know, patients that don't make it. And, uh, you know, that's hard to deal with sometimes. And, uh, you know, you find ways to sort of compartmentalize that. Um, and like I said, I think one of the healthiest ways to do that is just finding that hobby that you enjoy and, you know, pursuing that. So it's like, you know, I played the guitar for a really long time since so lo longer than you guys have been alive probably i'm not any good but i still play it so uh um but uh yeah uh catherine i guess the same question to you i mean can you want us to do a typical day for you and also i mean uh, do you get stressed out and how do you handle that well i guess i i would talk to this as in this capacity from two roles i've been both roles in this company i've been a critical care transport nurse currently i for the past year been managing the critical care transport division. So both of those come with a lot of stresses. Uh, the most stressful thing will be obviously um, getting the sickest patient that you can possibly imagine and hoping that you can do everything that's possible to keep that patient in the same condition that they're in or better by arriving to a facility. And it, yes, when you are the ultimate responsible person for that patient's care, it can indeed be very, very stressful. Um, and again, I have seen many of the outlets you do. And as a manager, it's even more stressful in other ways. As you know, Tim, being in management, now you have 25 or 30 people. In my case, I believe right now we're at about 30 nurses that I'm responsible for 24 seven. So that adds a different dynamic to my role I don't just come to work and go home at five o'clock and it's all good. I have to answer that phone because I never know who's out there that has a clinical concern, something that's going wrong on a call. They need my help to help them get through a call. If that, those, are, those are other stresses. Um, so I'm fortunate that I have a lot of high, highly skilled nurses. So I'm able now to be able to get some of those relieved and actual have time off. I guess it would be just making sure you take time for yourself learning that you you didn't make this person's condition and knowing that you've done everything possible to make a difference in their life and really patient connections, making that connection personal with a patient, it, it does make a difference. I enjoyed that very much. Yeah. I like to go to the house, but I love water. So that's <laughs> what I do for fun. <laughs> I, was gonna say, I thought you might bring up the houseboat. I mean, no. it's a lot of work for you, but I know you do it. So, um, so uh, I, there's some really great questions coming through that I definitely want to get to. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it sort of ties into the same thing. Uh, you know, one of the hardest challenges that you face and how you overcome it, um, situations that can be traumatizing, any advice for that? I mean, uh, I, I don't want to hog the spotlight, so I'll give uh, my colleagues a chance to answer also, but uh, again, for me, for, for any sort of traumatizing instance, um, it's, you know, finding that outlet. That's the great thing about the EMS community. It's, it's something that you don't get to appreciate until you're in it. Um, and that's just the sort of familial feel, the family that you're creating in EMS. You have your partner, 
Um, you have all of your friends that are at the station. Uh, it's a weird thing. So, I mean, you might not get along with somebody at the station, but you guys have gone through some things that most people don't. Um, and because of that, you get to talk to one another um, and sort of have that outlet. And, you know, they can, in a weird way, just talking about it with somebody else who understands what's going on, it's uh, super helpful in sort of getting over that trauma, um, you know, and, and living through it with somebody else and and just being there for one another. And, and like I said, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm lucky where, you know, Obviously, I'm, I'm the manager, so I kind of have to say it, but I'm lucky I get along with all of my employees here. And, uh, um, you know, uh, it's one of those things where, you know, I came up from the trenches, so to speak, with them. You know, I mean, I started out here as an EMT, so it's, you know, I was out there running the calls with them. And then I sort of moved up the, the chain from there. So, you know, because of that, uh, I think they trust me because they know that I've been there in the same situations that they've been in and have been able to handle those situations. And, you know, it goes the opposite way is, you know, is I'm a little bit more understanding in certain situations and circumstances because I've also been there so that they know they can come to me for any of those things. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's one of those things I, I'm, uh, not to make it too personal and all that stuff, but, uh, you know, my uh, my grandfather was a, a paratrooper in World War II. You know, real real hard as nails kind of guy, and uh, it's it's funny to think you know um, you know therapy was sort of a bad word back then. It was it's you know there's something wrong with that guy, and that's just how he went. But uh, you know, I, I I can't stress the importance of just talking, um, whether it's talking to somebody who who may not understand what you're going through, um, but just being able to get it off your chest. Uh, it's it's not. You know, there's nothing wrong with asking somebody for help. Um, and uh, I, I think that's, you know, worth its weight in gold for any situation, whether it's traumatizing or a challenge that you're overcoming. I mean, just reach, knowing to reach out for help and knowing that it's okay to reach out for help is, is awesome. I agree. And there's another thing we do in the critical care transport world, nursing world, so to say, as well as the EMS world, a very important component in dealing with traumatizing situations is we have what we call debriefings. So if we have a sentinel event, which means that that was a bad outcome, somebody died in a transfer, or there was a very serious injury resulting to that that caused a lot of trauma. For example, maybe a young child that is being transported and, and the patient codes in route, or they experience picking up somebody who's had other issues, but they die and everybody's performing everything they can to help save a life. So we call those debriefings. And what we do is we all get together and we talk. And EMS is a different kind of family. There's just a different camaraderie that exists here in the EMS world. I've worked in the hospital setting as an ICU nurse, as well as an ER nurse. And honestly, the camaraderie that you experience in this world is very different from the nursing world at least. And, um, in the hospital setting. I love the people and we all are kind of like extended family, if that makes any sense. But talking about it and then reviewing a situation, well, what did what went wrong? What could we do better next time? That's what we typically do in the EMS world to try to debrief besides personal, being able to separate personal work because you really don't have control of that situation. You can only do your training. I saw that somebody was asking, how do you stay calm and organized um, on the way to an emergency? Well, the way you do that is your training. Your training kicks in. It's more, it's like part of your, you know how, you all know how to sign onto the internet. You probably have Zoom down to a T by now. It's the same thing with our world. We are trained, highly trained, and we fall back on our protocols and our trainings to be able to stay calm and collected in a situation. So um, I've even recently had the experience of being involved in CPR on my own mother-in-law and to stay calm, being the only calm person that was a family member in the room besides my daughter who is a paramedic uh, is a very traumatic experience. You see it from a different light. So just saying that, you know, it's important to be able to talk to one another. That's why the EMS world, I think is a tight world. Yeah. It is definitely. And, and that really segues great because uh, speaking of training, Madison, it's, you know, uh, like I said, I'm a dinosaur, so it's been a long time since I've gone through it, but 
can you tell us about the process of becoming an EMT? Yeah, so I, um, you can go uh, to a community college. There's several different uh, ways you can do it. So I went um, to Foothill College um, and I think it's about six months uh, of training. Um, and then you take something called the National Registry um, exam, which is the official uh, exam that EMTs take um, in order to obtain their EMT card. Um, it's a certification. Um, and once you do that, then you can start applying um, to the companies that you uh, wish to work for. And was that training pretty easy? Or, I mean, I just going off of what Catherine said, I mean, you rely on your training, is it you do rely on your training. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say easy. I mean, it was, there was challenges and, uh, but I mean, as long as you stick to it, you study, um, and you really take the course seriously, um, there really shouldn't be any, uh, anything that will get in your way in terms of getting your EMT certification. So, um, no, it was all good experiences for me. What kind of classes, um, you know, do you think would benefit uh, the people attending this class right now uh, would help them in, you know, if they wanted to become EMTs or, or move on from there? What kind of classes right now do you think would be helpful for that? Yeah, I would say um, taking a CPR course um, helps a lot, especially when uh, you go uh, to, into your EMT courses. Uh, we will be reviewing CPR. Um, uh, in greater detail, but it's nice to have that background. Um, I was a, a Palo Alto fire explorer, um, which was something that was held for high school students. Um, and without that training, I think EMT school would have been actually a lot harder. So if you have uh, a local fire department that holds uh, a fire explorers program for you guys who are in high school, I would highly recommend uh, joining because that's where I got a lot of my uh, exposure to EMS training and uh, learning acronyms for uh, certain uh, skills that we do. So that, that would be my advice. Yeah. And uh, I'm just going to add on to that for me. Um, uh, I think anatomy and physiology is a super important, um, you know, cornerstone of any field, whether it's EMS, um, you know, going into nursing, becoming a doctor. Uh, there's just so many career paths that stem from this. Um, but anatomy and physiology is super important. Learning the human body um, and, and knowing that everything works together, you know, um, your blood can pump, but without oxygen, it's, it's, no good, you know, and, you know, with all the oxygen in the world, and no blood pumping, then it's also worthless. So um, I, I, learning that all the parts of the body are integrated is super important. And you'll pick that up in anatomy and physiology. And that's something that I mean, whether it's EMS or the hospital or anything, just knowing how the human body works is super important. Um, and another one that I think kind of gets overlooked is, um, you know, English or, uh, or writing classes are, are super important because you're writing reports like uh like madison was talking about with our electronic patient care reports i mean you have to paint a picture of everything that happened on that call um because if something happens you know you want to remember what happens i mean we're running you know hundreds of calls a year i mean how are you going to remember what happened last february you know what i mean um so writing a really detailed report talking about you know how you responded what the scene was like when you got there um and the best the best description i can give is really with your words you're painting a picture of everything that happened on that call from the minute you got dispatched to that call to the minute you turned over care of that call at the hospital um so uh, i think writing classes are are very good uh at helping in that and then again anatomy and physiology if you know how the, the all the components of the human body and and at least have an idea of how they work. It's a little bit easier to sort of get that, you know, on the fly diagnosis of, okay, well this happened. So it's possibly this, this, or this, you know? Uh, um, and uh, I think those are the classes that really help. Uh, any additional information from you, Catherine, on that, on what might help uh, moving on in a career? Well, I, I do feel that 
honestly, once you become an EMT, that simple course that you take and taking the health part, uh, BLS healthcare provider, CPR, first aid, maybe a, a, a American Heart has a first aid course that's very good. Um, if this door opens opportunities. I was an EMT and I, I am very thankful that I had that experience because that experience, I can say that there's nothing, my very first code blue, my very first day on the job in the 911 system as an EMT was a code blue on a three month old baby. And it was a very sad case because the, there was a babysitter situation and the baby had gotten stuck with her head in the crib and she strangled herself. Um, that was a very stressful call, but we did, we were able to get pulses back, fly her to, uh, she went to Valley Children's, I believe. And unfortunately she did not survive, but I have to say that that experience ingrained in me a passion for EMS. And I loved that job. It was the most rewarding job that I have ever had in my life to that point. And I started in my early twenties as an EMT. So now here I am years later, that passion never left me. It gave me the desire to go back to nursing school. So and again, you're gonna have to start doing like, uh, I believe that one of the paramedics, what's his name, uh, Tim, mm -hmm. um, said how important it is to keep your slate clean. And that's true. You wanna do well in your four courses, English, anatomy, physiology, microbiology, math, uh, public speaking, or these things. All your high school things you're doing now and early college work will count toward getting into a nursing program. So always give your best in your studies because you never know where it's gonna take you. And the EMS world or just coming into this leads to a lot of different careers. You can go a lot of different pathways from an EMT. There really is a wide open opportunity. So um, take your studies very seriously. Yeah. And, uh, you know, since you did get to hear from all different levels, um, it's, you know, a nice way to say that, you know, EMS, especially starting out as an EMT, it's a great building block to future careers. Whether you want to stay in EMS or not, it leads to paramedic, firefighter, um, police, uh, respiratory therapists, registered nurse, physician's assistant, perfusionist. There's a lot of different fields out there. I mean, all the way up to, uh, you know, if you want to become a doctor, it's a great building block. We have a, a lot of people who come through here that are going to school. They want some patient contact hours. They want to, you know, get involved in the community also, but you know, they want to get some hands-on experience with patients before moving on in the medical field. Um, you know, and they move on to nursing school. In fact, uh, Kubiak, who's a medic, you know, he's, he's uh, starting nursing school here pretty soon. Um, you know, and he's done EMT, paramedic, and now he'll be a nurse. Um, like Catherine said, she started out as an EMT and now she's a nurse. I mean, even more than that, she's the manager of the entire nursing department for pro transport. So, um, uh, but I mean, outside of if you don't even want to get into EMS uh, or stay in EMS, I mean, starting out in EMS is it, it helps build great life skills um, that help in careers outside of healthcare. Uh, it really helps with uh, teamwork, communication, uh, multitasking, prioritization. Um, you know, it, it helps all of those things. Again, even communication, writing stuff. Like I said. A writing class is fantastic uh, to, to get real good experience on writing your reports. And then that just helps with everything else in your career, whether that's an EMS or not. Can I add one more thing to that? Please. Yeah, I think also another uh, a good um, prerequisite into uh, this uh, EMS world is I think that if you're, if you're uh, considering uh, being an EMT or paramedic or police officer, or firefighter, uh, go out and volunteer in your community. Um, there's lots of opportunities to meet the people um, where uh, you can uh, communicate with them. And if you like being around people and talking to people, then I think that's just more of a reason uh, why you should come and join the EMS family. Yeah. Um. 
I feel like a lot of these questions have been kind of, you know, sort of down, you know, trauma and all this stuff. Uh, there's a really great, great question on here about what's the best call you've ever had or the call you're most proud of. Um, and uh, I really like that one. One of my favorite calls, and it was a real, real simple call as far as calls go. Um, there was a, uh, a pediatric patient, I think he was about five years old, um, and he needed a lung transplant. And he was flown in from, I believe, Wyoming or Idaho. I, I can't remember, this was a few years back, but um, he was getting flown in and going to one of the children's hospitals. And, uh, you know, I got to be the, the ambulance that went and picked him up from the airport. And, you know, I'm expecting a lung, trunk, a lung transport patient. This is going to be bad. You know, he's going to be, uh, you know, it's uh, again, sick kids are always really hard to see. So, um, but, uh, you know, we pull up at the airport, we wait for the plane to land and the plane lands and this, you know, adorable little kid comes walking off with a stuffed Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle that's about the size of him. <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, his lungs aren't working as good as they're supposed to. So he's got uh, uh, what's called cyanotic lips, where his, his lips are just as blue as his shirt was. And, uh, but, you know, he was, uh, he was a trooper. He was in the, you know, just this great little kid. He came up, he gave everyone high fives. He was able to walk off the plane by himself. And, uh, you know, we transported him to, uh, to the hospital where uh, they did the surgery. And, you know, uh, one of the hard things about EMS is, you know, you kind of move on with every call because after you drop off, it's just, you know, that's as much as you know about it. Um, luckily, with some of these contracted facilities, you know, you get to see uh, some of the same patients again in not the too distant future. And it was you know, one of the re most rewarding things for me was knowing that, again, you know, getting to see this kid after his lung transplant and seeing him, you know, just so much more full of color and just, you know, so invigorated and, and he was happy from the start and he was happy afterwards. And, you know, that's one of the calls that really resonates with me. And, you know, again, I mean, I've run thousands of calls and that's one of the like, hey, this was awesome. You know, like got this little kid, he was in the best of spirits and he still is. He got some you know, fortunate enough to get some new lungs and uh, it was really great. Do you guys have any other examples for us? I could give one from my 911 experience more so just um, the first field save that was an, he was an adult patient and we were, had CPR had been started on him and EMS got there really quickly. We already had fire on scene. We were able to get pulses back and ROSC, which for another medical term for you guys, that means return of spontaneous circulation. So he was able to be revived and to be able to talk to him a week later in the ICU was, that was a rewarding experience. So there's a lot of good um, experiences I've had, but that one was one of, that I can remember right off the top of my head that really stuck with me through the years. Yeah, awesome. And I know we're, uh, we're getting, getting close to our uh our time here uh, um I actually know, just to... hey yeah i'm gonna put myself on mute for a minute okay um cool um so uh just to touch on some of these other things i i know we touched on it a little bit but uh you know how to go what prerequisites are required for emt training um honestly uh just Graduating from high school, uh, getting into a like uh, Madison said, community colleges offer courses. Um, getting your CPR card done. Um, CPR is just a four-hour training, uh, and you know I know we had some technical difficulties with uh, the video, but um, just learning CPR is such an important skill. Like like Catherine said, uh, most of the people uh, who have cardiac emergencies, it's going to be somebody that you know, not a stranger. So um, knowing how to, how to help your, you know, family members uh, is super important. Um, and then uh, for uh, paramedic, it's usually about a two-year program. Uh, like I said, it's a little more advanced, uh, a lot more concentration on some medications that you cannot give as an EMT. Um, and a lot more focus on, uh, on the heart and uh, cardiography. Um, and then nursing. Uh, so there's different levels of nursing. Uh, to get your basic RN as a registered nurse, it's a minimum of a two-year program. Um, 
uh, and then you can go uh, go for the gusto like Catherine and get your bachelor's uh, in it, which is uh, which is for you know a four year program um, and, and getting your bachelor's as a nurse. Um, and uh, yeah. And just on the nursing thing, there's there's a couple of years of prereqs just to get your associate's degree in nursing. The uh, there's five core courses and there's a lot of community colleges that you can almost get a hundred percent ride to go. The average cost for an ADN, which is an associate's degree, is between six and seven thousand dollars. However, uh, depending on the income, most of that can be covered through the Pell Grant and um, the different programs they have at community colleges. So I myself, I started with my ADN program and uh, did my prerequisites before that. I started nursing school in August of 2014 and graduated in, in May of 2016. And I, and I went straight into ICU as a, a ICU nurse. And I worked for in the ICU for around seven months and I went to the ER and I started nursing uh, school back on my bachelor's. I did that online. And actually it gave me the freedom to be able to work full time to continue to learn and grow as a nurse while I was pursuing my bachelor's degree. And I, I was able to actually take a lot of that and put it into my nursing, um, my nursing bit knowledge and, and it helped me quite a bit. So you don't have to do it all at once. Uh, that's a really good path to go. Community colleges are the most reasonable. Um, my nursing degree costs less than half of my sister-in-law's nursing degree. And she went mm -hmm. through a private college, spent about $60,000. It cost me, well, by the Pell Grant, I was fortunate at the time with income. I really didn't pay anything. I actually uh, won a scholarship for nursing. I graduated um, Alpha Gamma Sigma and Phi Theta Kappa. I kept my, I graduated from my bachelor's degree with honors, uh, really took my studies very seriously. So um, because of those, I was able to get extra scholarships and um, it helped pay for my nursing school. That's awesome. Uh, and I know, I mean, we're, we're running a little overtime here, but uh, so just one, one quick last question, if that's all right. Uh, and uh, this is for you, Catherine, just to talk about, um, uh, I, I know that uh, you have some experience in dispatch centers uh, and stuff like that, but if you can just maybe talk a little bit about dispatcher training and, um, and uh, you know, how, how that goes, what kind of mistakes, if ever they make any, uh, wink, wink. Um, a lot, we all know that's a bad <laughs> question, <laughs> but yes, okay. So also in my wonderful time it, as being involved in the EMS, one of the things I really had the opportunity to do was to, uh, at a, the first ambulance company I worked at many years ago, started as an EMT, worked into a, a, a supervisor role within the first year, I was promoted to ambulance personnel supervisor, dispatch supervisor, and transforming an EMD 911 dispatch center. So in that role, if, you are, if you're thinking about that path, it also is a really good path to uh, start your career or see what you might wanna do. Now, what would it take to be a good dispatcher? You have to have the ability to multitask. You need to be very good with your uh, north, south, east, west. So for example, if you live in the, your, an area such as Santa Clara, you would really wanna have a good grasp on the layout of that because a lot of dispatching programs require you to take a test. It's a simple test, but you have to know where you are and, and what's north, what's south, what's east, what's west. So it's really important to um, be able to, to have that skill to understand those things. So again, knowing where you live, I would recommend that if you were gonna start in that pathway that you would try even even in Merced Police Department, which I did that as well, I've been a police dispatcher also. So um, same thing, you have to really be on top of stuff. But it's a great job. It's a good learning. And it's very stressful at times. But yes, they do make mistakes. <laughs> I could say quite often. But um, for the most part, they're really good. And uh, but mistakes do happen. And what do we do? We just buckle up and we just get it done. And it's a great great opportunity for a someone trying to get their foot in the door of something different dispatchers actually have quite a good income um so 
I know some dispatchers in the Bay Area that probably make around 65 to 75,000 a year or more. Actually, I know a couple that make more than that, but just saying it is a good career. Yeah, and especially in this area, I mean, uh, um, I, you know, here in Santa Clara County, I mean, you can look on online uh, at the county website um, and, and it shows you the salary. It's a lot of work, but it's, it's really worth it. Uh, can you give us just a, a little more on how they train for uh, a dispatch job? So there's different steps in it. If you're talking about EMD dispatcher, for example, it has a different, a lot of different steps to get to become an EMD dispatcher. So when you're first hired, if you haven't gone through a specialized course, which requires, I believe it's a three-day training course, and it ends with a, a written test, as well as you still have to go into the dispatcher and train, um, they start you off as a call taker. You learn the role of call taker, and you start getting familiar with the intake process. You're not the one that's receiving the 911 calls. You may be doing, um, you know, Mary Jane's calling because she has a broken leg and she needs to go to a doctor's appointment. So you're going to set up a wheelchair transfer, for example. You're not going to be the person getting, oh, my, uh, I'm having chest pain right now. What an EMD dispatcher does is they specialize. We have a process, a series of cards and, and things that we run based on what you call with as a, a chief complaint. As an example, chest pain. There's a chest pain protocol the dispatchers train to actually stay on the phone with you and give you all the pre-arrival instructions that you need to do that job. So eventually by starting as a call taker, you can be trained on higher levels. And then ultimately at the end, you take a specialized course that's three to five days. And then uh, still again, even after you become a dispatcher as an EMD certified dispatcher, you still will have to go to training in that place to get more training to spend with like a, what we would call a preceptor um, in the nursing world. There would be like a trainer to learn. Awesome. Um, does anybody else have any other questions? I mean, type them up real quick. If not, then... Uh... You know, I want, I want to say thank you for your time. Well, um, Tim, Catherine, and Madison, a huge thank you to the three of you for um, conducting the Q&A and, and doing this fantastic uh, field trip and, and um, uh, being available for, for all of these uh, students today. Um, I want to share with everyone a contact list actually for um, the um, group from uh, Pro Transport. And just give me a second to get to this. Uh, here we go. Um, if everyone wants to just take a picture um, of this uh, contact sheet, it will give you email addresses in case you have any questions that you want to follow up after the event. Um, in addition, we are gonna drop a survey into the chat right now. And uh, we would really appreciate it if you guys would fill out the survey. It'll just take you a few minutes um, and just give us some feedback about the event. After today's event, I will be sharing this contact list, the survey, and one other thing with your teachers to provide to you guys. And that is an entry-level healthcare job guide. And this is gonna have more information about each of the entry level jobs in EMS, as well as about 37 different entry level healthcare jobs with descriptions and videos and free training options for each one of the, uh, of the positions. So with that, um, I just want to say a huge thank you to the whole team at Pro Transport One, Tim Taylor, Catherine Pish, Madison Valentine, Zach Whiting, and Zach's awesome filmmaker brother, Jacob Whiting, and Tim Kubiak for being here today and um, providing this fantastic field trip for uh, the kids. Um, I also wanna say a big thank you to the team at uh, Andrew Hill High School, including the head of the medical magnet program, Jen Dangerfield Barber, and the two terrific anatomy and physiology teachers, 
uh, Joanne Winterstein and uh, Waylon Shi. Um, thank you so much for being our partners today. Uh, and lastly, I just want to thank Amy Wender from Wender Weiss Foundation for Children, the founder, uh, for her support and making today possible. So thank you all for coming. Thank you very much to the students for taking time on your Wednesday to be here with us and uh, have a wonderful afternoon.